Hello, movie lovers. Welcome home. My name is Amy Hinsterling, and you're listening to Watch This List. This is a very special edition of Provocateur, which is arguably my first provocateur, even though I think this is like my 10th episode. Uh, Watching Lars von Trier's filmography the past two weeks has made me realize just how not provocative some of the other (laughs) directors I chose were. So I don't know, Miles, do you feel like he's like, would you, you'd rank him as like in the tops, right? For you? Yes. 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 In terms of, for myself, in my own opinion, in terms of quality, but also in terms of just pure (laughs) provoking uh, kind of sensation or level, I guess. Yeah. And, and I feel like it's, it's fair to say that him as a person is also like of the personality that he likes to poke at people and society. And so it's not just that his films are provocative. I feel like he sort of embodies that spirit himself as a person. Yes, yes, definitely. And I think, I think I went into, I mean, when I first got into his films in like um, 2019 um, or first started watching them at least and like being confused by them, I was like, I had I had I'd heard of his reputation and just being like, "What this is this guy? Is he like an asshole or is he just a troll?" Which right. people, uh, the way we, I've been in your comments in the films we've been watching, everyone's saying he's a troll, which I understand, of course. Um, right. But the way that I guess the way that he's um, over time that he's developed into one of my favorite filmmakers, as I've watched like interviews with him or people, especially the actors that he's worked with who just have like a ton of respect for him and the way that he is on set, which I guess we don't ever see. We just kind of see this aftermath of like him being <laughs> very trolly in, in public. Well, but obviously like you can tell from the performances, especially by the females that they, I don't think they would be able to invest like that if they didn't trust him completely. So it's, yeah. it seems like it's very obvious to me that there's a special trust or relationship there that they must have felt otherwise I don't think he would have been able to get that you know what I mean yeah yeah exactly yeah so that's not a surprise to me that they would be like oh you know he was great to work with because why would they keep doing it he has so many movies that are female centric yeah and how and why and how would he be able to keep making I mean I know there are some people who are able to keep making more but that's maybe because they also make a ton of money and I don't think it's films make a ton of money they're just like really fun to work on I guess right like my friend Mark was saying that you know he really puts women through the ringer and like especially that it seems like he's kind of a glutton for punishment and enjoys watching them suffer but I don't think that the actresses feel that way about their characters you know I don't think that um, she feels that way about Selma or Emily Watson feels that way about Bess or Nicole feels that way about Grace. It seems like uh-huh. it's, they have like a real compassion for their characters. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, um, I was watching, a before, I guess to wrap up this like contextualizing of, of what we're going to talk about here, I watched Manderley last night as the second to last film yeah. of, of kind of our group that we're going to watch. And, and I'm kind of glad I did because, it was, I mean, it, it, it's it's very different from a lot of his films, particularly Dogville, which is supposed to be a sequel to, and also watching, like, watching Bryce Dallas Howard talk about the film afterwards and her experience with the film afterwards was, like, a very, like, I don't know, it, it, it sort of uh, uh, solidified my, like, my opinion of like of him as a director in terms of at least just specifically directing actors. Um, what, what, what did said, she say? What did she say that he, you felt like was moving? I don't, I don't know if it was like, maybe it was just like the time that I watched it at, but especially with, with Kirsten Dunst in Melancholia and with Bryce Dallas Howard in Manderley, they seem, there's something similar about the two of those performances specifically that like they, <laughs> It's it's a weird way to say it, but they're like the only 
they're like humans who have come into an alien world or that's how i feel about their characters that that like they're doing something that is so um kind of raw in a way that's like different not better or worse but different from someone like charlotte gainsbourg in antichrist for example mm. where or or charlotte gainsbourg in any of his films which i think she does an amazing job but she but she kind of like she and um uh some other actors or nicole kidman might like very much be within the world and feeling like kind of pawns that he is written and that he's controlling and puppeteering um again not that that makes their performances any better or worse but just something that like i don't know like bryce dallas howard and and kirsten dunce in each of their respective films that they worked with him on like are so they just seem so eager to be there <laughs> i don't know like that that you don't even have to watch an interview afterwards to know that that's the case you know I kind of feel that way. Actually, I felt that way about Uma Thurman in uh, uh, House That Jack Built yeah. and Nymphomaniac, too, where it's yeah. just like she, f- you, I don't know, like you're saying you get this <laughs> sense that she's like so down for it. And like, it's almost like I feel like I felt this way about Dylan, Matt Dylan for sure, where it's like uh-huh. this like, opportunity to behave very badly and, and sort of exercise (laughs) like acting chops in a way that you don't normally get an opportunity to so i think that's probably fun for them you know yeah yeah for sure and i would i mean and i've i've acted a lot before and i and i can totally see like being on the set and like from what they describe as the atmosphere of being on set that is totally i mean i don't know if we can even conceive of it right now just thinking about it but like must be like so so fun but also like so because you have to you there's a necessity to be vulnerable and to be like if you are kind of this tortured woman character that is going through hell then you you have to be like okay with being completely vulnerable and so you know that's i I assume that's what it's like yeah there was a comment that you made about the idiots specifically that i thought was interesting where you said that you were admiring the way in which the actors were engaging in their roles. Like, what did you mean by, cause, cause the idiots is a, is a one where it's like, it seems like they would actually be uncomfortable even in pretense to yeah. act that way, but they seem so at ease. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I guess what I was saying is that there's a, and I did say this in my review that there's a meta aspect to it where I'm, I'm watching, you know, just these people or the characters, you know, act like idiots and all be together in a highly like not just vulnerable, but like very intentionally offensive way. Yes. And in a way that's like they're just not. But I think more so to me, like in a way that's like against social norms rather than particularly making fun of anybody like they I think they want it's a weird philosophy in that, in that film that they have, or maybe an anti philosophy or no philosophy at all. But the point is that like being, I, I, I feel weirdly like I would want to be there and like with them and kind of like Karen and just be like questioning, but having fun and being able to like do anything and have that be, accepted by by the group but genuinely and not accepted because we feel like we have to or we feel like you know we're gonna get kicked out if we don't but just like people who are truly in their like these animalistic instincts at their base level i think that's what's so interesting about it because if they had just kept it to themselves and not brought it out i think there's like because this is where it sort of veers off from the cult like I kept thinking that it was like a cult, you know, where vulnerable people are attracted to a situation where someone is telling them exactly what to do. They sort of shed reality. They don't have their normal responsibilities anymore. They're not around their family. But the difference here was is that they weren't just like a commune. They were going out into the world and then judging people for their reactions to them. And that's kind of what it seemed like they got off on. Yeah. was being like, oh, you know, if we're like this in a restaurant – we're rejected or whatever. So it wasn't just. It's not about building. They don't want to build anything, you know? Right. They, they literally just want to act however they want, but not just that 
It's that they want to prove that other people are not able to accept or that they judge them. Just like the lady who comes over who's looking at the house. I don't think she's a bad person yeah. at all. But the you know the main guy, what's his name? Uh, Stoffer. 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 That he's making it a it almost like oh like look at this terrible person for not wanting to live near handicapped yeah. people. Yeah. But he's so deranged in yeah. his in his philosophy that you can't. It's hard to even grasp. I don't know. It's hard to empathize. It, 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 sure. Yeah. And I think that's totally fair for that for that movie in particular, but also just like where I read like reviews of all of Von Trier's films and just see mm-hmm. like, I couldn't handle this or this was not like, I appreciate whatever themes or whatever. And I just, I can't watch it. I can't do and it. I'm like, yeah, right. that, that makes sense to me. I'm not like, I'm inclined to agree with pretty much any opinion that like that people have a, about his films. Um, but, but where I see like, I guess where I see the value in that and the value in like not being, or, or, or where I see him not being a troll is in the ability to not only, I mean, we've talked about the actors being vulnerable, but, but himself to be vulnerable and to like, you know, direct these actors and also write a story that is like, let's just talk about this thing that no one wants to talk about and investigate it in a way that's like, you know, I'm not drawing any conclusions. I'm not saying anything about this necessarily all the time. Um, uh, particularly in the idiots, I don't think there's like a one statement to take away, and there's scenes that change tone within seconds, and like you know these terrible things that happen, but then the next scene is really funny, and you feel bad, and like th- th- I think it's just about investigating those feelings and investigating what we're like. What is your reaction to this? I made this thing here. What is what is your just basic reaction? Well, and I really do think that he's questioning like people's beliefs and their convictions i really think he's trying to say when you're isolated and you're around like-minded people it's one thing but then as soon as it's like do this at your job do this with your with your wife and child you know whatever people are like nope i can't do it i guess you know i didn't believe it and there's like a crisis of faith at that point that's what i think is the most valuable insight is to, to be like and it doesn't have to be like religious it could be whatever you think when you're like down to the wire and it it, it, you could face consequences for professing what your position is if you can't do it then he's right where it's like what are you doing then you might as well leave yeah and you and you might as well be like and again i like what you said it's not about religion or yeah it a cult and it's like adjacent to those things but more so of like you could just be with your friends and like, these are just your friends. And it's like, do you, are you a part of this friend group? And do you trust us? And do you trust yourself around when you're around us? And like, if we don't have that trust as friends, um, then it's, then, you know, we're all going to feel weird and it's not going to be. Right. Right. But then he just, he, anytime that I feel like he's making a salient point, it just gets like bombarded by like inappropriate, yeah. Uh, st- stuff that just like completely puts you off. But that's where I don't know if he's just a sadist and just enjoys uh, torturing us or people or if there's some sort of merit. Because this is where it gets into murky territory. You know, there's a lot of directors where you're like, are they just, do they like the fact that they do, they push it too far or is there a point, you know, or is there a point where it is too far? Like, where is that? Do you feel like there's even a line there with I, I, him? I guess, <laughs> I guess, like, I don't know. Going back to Manderley briefly, I, 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 I know you didn't like that one as much. I didn't expect to like it that much, but I actually really did. And part of the reason was because um, it was not like. I, I think it's just a really good drama. Like if you, t- if you separate it from Dogville totally, which I think he should have done is just like, yeah, that's, be its own, that was my problem yeah. was that I, yeah. it's hard. Yeah. Thinking of her as grace and like Willem Dafoe as James Conn, I was like, yeah. oh, it was just <laughs> very like, difficult. But, but eventually, but, uh, and then I'm watching it. Like, I'm just going to actually like remove that because I don't like that. And so I'm going to remove Dogville from my mind and just be like, this is yeah. its own thing, which I, again, I just wish it was, but 
anyway, the like the drama in that movie just was really interesting to me. And the part of the part of the way that it is tied to Dogville is in its desire to, you know, provoke and have this dramatic imagery like the which in that movie in particular feels random to me like the as particularly the blackface and the whipping and like things that are not like that that was just feeling like it he wanted to be there but didn't know how to make it there in a way in a way that like made any sense um which i think like compared to dogville i think dogville has some pretty violent and terrible imagery and things that people say about each other but it's all like you're kind of you're kind of into the ridiculousness of it all by the time by the time it starts to happen by the time things to start to go very downhill um uh so i don't i guess i don't i'm trying to say it now but like i don't even know what the particular difference is i think it's interesting that you know it comes down to the viewer and like people seem to like dogville a lot more maybe because it is kind of it has been it is it is more like i don't know focused maybe it has a or focus a focal point. i i think maybe also it's easier it's more palatable maybe yeah. like dogville to me is like sort of like the house that jack built where i feel like von Trier is telling on himself where it's yeah. like paul bettany and stellan skarsgård and all the characters sort of inhabit different parts of lars and he's yeah. kind of grappling with like well i'm I'm a man that's like this, but I'm also like this, and I'm also like this. So Dogville feels like a, a a more clear like delineation between very specific characters, whereas Manderley is about colonialism and slavery and like racism, and it I don't know why, but it feels a lot more political to me than yeah. Dogville does. Dogville feels very personal yes. and kind of confessional, and then. Manderley feels topical, like like he's trying to like judge uh, society in a different way as opposed to himself. And so I, I don't know. It comes across very differently to me, almost like ooh, like yikes, like yeah. I don't know. Maybe yeah. Just no, doesn't I, feel I think PC. that's a good point. I think that's a good point because like th the way that like I, I mean, he, and he said this before. This is one of the earliest things I heard him like when I was first getting into his filmography, like he said all of the characters in my movies are like parts of me or parts of my brain that like, I'm thinking this way or I'm thinking this way, but they're combating. And then this other thought comes into my head and I'm like, or, and maybe grace in Dogville is like the, the centerpiece of like, that's, and he says like the female character are maybe more who I am than anyone else. And that's why I have them be my leads. Cause that is like, I feel like a, a female sensibility in art or in general is, is more how I, how I feel on the inside and what, what, what I want to express. Whereas like, so I, I think maybe the difference is that like, you can feel when it's personal and when it's not like exactly. when thing when things are like, I mean, it's all provoking, but when it's provoking from a place of honesty and a place of like, I genuinely had thoughts about this and wanted to show it on film in order to figure it out or figure myself out, then it, comes off like much more I, I mean if you if you can think about it for a moment and look at what you're you know look at the terrible things happening on screen and, and contextualize it for a minute and be like okay what why <laughs> or why does he why does he feel that way and how how do these feelings coalesce and um like that's that's maybe more like when people say like oh i can't get into i i can't handle the violence where you're you're not able to see like and to no fault of your own as an audience member or a viewer, but like, I can't see how this is personal to him versus some things that are like really violent or really transgressive are like genuine, they appear to be like genuine things that have like, that he's just like, I'm going to be honest and vulnerable about this. Yeah. And I think honestly, also what, what is helpful I found is like, he puts a conscience in a lot of his movies too, like Verge. Yeah. And uh when Bess is talking to God, yeah. I feel like Lars is oftentimes as a filmmaker showing both those things. Like that conflict we all have, Pinocchio and Jiminy Cricket, where it's like, 
I want to do all of these terrible things, but then there's also this voice either that I pray to or it's inside my head or whatever, and it could be mental illness or whatever you want to call it, or literal in the case of Jack. Yeah. Um, but there's something that is speaking to his selfishness and the desire to destroy or a lack of empathy. And I feel like, like melancholy is a good example of this too, where I think Kirsten Dunst is terrible. I know that she's depressed and it's about like depression, but I think she's also just a rotten person. But then you have Charlotte Gainsbourg who she has problems too, but is a kinder version of the sister. You know, you've got like somebody who's really trying to help kind of like a addict situation, like the codependent person. But I'm just saying, I think that Lars always has two sides and he's trying to kind of wrestle within the films like which one is better and which one should be listened to or are they both valuable yeah or or when are they bo- when are they each valuable like first of all with the house of jackal the um, maybe the most obvious version of like <laughs> just these two extremes of like you know verge who's being like you are a crazy insane man and we all know it and then every once in a while jack is like let me just let me just uh, what's so great about the movie is like you can just see like this is a serial killer and he's just describing his life and it's not even like he's just like making all the metaphors very clear and like explaining everything explaining the joke right explaining the meaning behind everything which is not what you typically want if you know in a typical movie about a serial killer or just a character study in general it's not about like i want to hear what they have to say it's i want to see what they do and make my own inferences jack doesn't allow any inferences he makes it clear okay this is exactly what I'm thinking and what I'm meaning to do. And he's, I don't think he's lying. He's not like trying to, he's not lying to get attention or, or from Verge or from anyone, but like the, the attention seeking in him is like, please, you know, listen to me as I explain this thing that I truly believe. And it's very vile and it's disgusting and disturbing and I should go to hell for it. But like, let me just, let me just talk about it. And then you can like, then afterwards we can like, okay, fine. I'll go to hell. And like, you know, whatever, but let me just have this moment. It's it's kind of, it reminded me a lot of American Psycho, except that I think that Bateman is a lot more deluded. Like, yeah. I, I, I feel like the difference, because Patrick in American Psycho is narrating the whole time, we're inside his head, we know, like, he explains why he does things and, and how he does, but the difference between him and Jack is, I feel like Jack is more introspective in a you know i don't know i i feel like he is trying to figure out the morality situation by talking to verge it's not just like this madness and all these excuses (laughs) it seems like he's not having that much fun either whereas patrick just like glories in it yes yeah but jack is like he is so frustrated and that's where this yeah. comedy comes in where he's just like, and he has the OCD and he's like thinking about like, wait, did I leave blood on the table? The blood and on just the these t- ridiculous, <laughs> these ridiculous things where you see his flaws on display, but also he's seeing that in the same, at the same time and being like, I wish I wasn't like this. And I wish I could perfect everything and make it, make it this perfect art form. Like these people in history have like Adolf Hitler, who we, you know, aspires to be like, which, okay. But like that, that dissatisfaction is so funny to watch because I mean, not only is it just fun, like, okay, we don't want this guy to get what he wants and we want him to be dissatisfied, but also like the search for like, it becomes this, this own little tiny thing about like just Jack's search for meaning and not like humanity or whatever, but like, I'm just, I'm just so interested in this guy and like what he's what he's doing and why he's doing it and like his failures and successes and what he considers that to be. It really, I don't know. Have you seen adaptation by Charlie Kaufman? Yeah. Okay. It reminded me a lot of that actually. And I, I feel like in the sort of like turning the camera around on himself way, I think that he's very similar to Charlie Kaufman because adaptation, he literally puts Charlie Kaufman as a character and then makes (laughs) it, and then makes an alter ego twin. I mean, it's not subtle at all. Yeah. Um, and so you know that like this person, but I don't I don't see either situation as just like pure narcissism. I think that they are 
almost begrudgingly putting themselves in the narrative because they don't know how to solve their issues without doing that. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, I know there's like some artists who are less obviously involved, but I'm not sure that they are able to not put themselves into every single thing they do and like for their yeah. own. I mean, and it goes back to vulnerability of like, if you're gonna, and, and a ton of writers, you know, put them have like a self insert character into your story, but like, it's really annoying when you can see that it's obviously a self insert and they're giving themselves all these great qualities. And like, I'm the hero of the story. And I'm like, yeah, oh, I have these kind of quirky flaws, but I want to. And so Von Schreer is like, again, back to the vulnerability. I'm going to make myself the worst person ever in this movie. And th that bravery to like, not like within the context of the film, having verge there, he's not trying to justify his thoughts or his actions or his, these weird beliefs or thoughts that maybe he just sometimes has or, or fe just feelings that he has to get out there. It's, it's not justified at all. He's the worst person you could imagine. And so that is like, th that doesn't seem like bragging or anything to me, or it doesn't seem like pr provoking for the sake of like, Ooh, I'm, I'm, I'm this crazy guy. Watch me be crazy. It's like, you know, watch me be crazy and then judge me for it because I'm, over here writing this story about how I'm judging myself for it all the time. And I think that Verge is also in that way, sort of a stand in for critics because yeah. he's constantly saying like, do you think that this is impress me? Like there's nothing that you can say that I haven't heard before. Basically like, you know, the artist's worst fear is that they have no originality. Just like it's, yeah. you know, at the beginning of ad adaptation, do I have an original yeah. thought in my head yeah. that so the worst thing you can do is say, I'm unimpressed. And there's, you know, you don't have anything about you that I haven't heard a thousand times. And yeah. Verge says that all along the way through yeah. the levels. He's just like, what is it now, Jack? Oh, so you did this <laughs> yeah, other thing. So, Congratulations. Yeah. You know? So <laughs> I feel like, like that's like, Lars judging yeah, himself. And it's so funny to me. It's so, like, it's one of the funniest movies I've ever seen because he's like, I don't know. Maybe it reminds people, I me mean, of people in my life who are like, you know, not nearly as bad as Jack, but who have like, you know, I don't know. You're talking to a random artsy guy at a party and he's just like trying to explain like all this heady, like, oh yeah. And, and this poetry means like this to me. And I'm just like, I don't care. <laughs> but like, but like the, the, the feeling of like, but that feeling times a million and times you know, by seeing this, like this guy for two and a half hours go on about the craziest stuff that makes no sense. That That is like, it's funny, but also like, again, like you see his vulnerability and you see his, like, I'm just so enticed by this man who is like, has the worst opinions. And he's and so, to, he's so exhausted at being yeah. the thing that that makes him so, uh, like I can see him in a lot of men in life is yeah. this, he's like, it's so exhausting to have to explain <laughs> myself all the time, you know? Yeah. And so you're like, oh man, poor Jack, you know, um, yeah. how do you bear that burden? But well, he's like, you kill them. Um, but I think that this is, I, I like Jack in the way that I like the boss of it all, where it's like, this person is so their like interpretation of reality and like circumstances and stuff. They feel uh -huh. like they're the main character of the scene, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and there's no sort of talking to them about like where they actually are, or what they're actually doing. Yeah. And they never yeah. get a sense of that at all. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. The boss of it all was arguably, I, I think it was actually funnier than house of Jack, which I did not think. I, w I was laughing so hard, especially the first half of that movie, when he's like, um, when the woman comes in and she's trying to like, he's like, I know you've been trying to seduce me. And he's like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> this is the weirdest, just like, I don't know. I love that maybe about all his movies, but it's maybe it's easier to see in the comedies that like, just what is like the, the, the most uncomfortable or the weirdest or strangest situation I can put these characters in. And then let's see how they react to it. Right. Which is and either then, really funny or really sad. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's. I, I read today I, in the little Breaking the Waves uh, Criterion pamphlet I have essay that mm-hmm. Lars was saying he's just a, attracted to extremes and he yeah. he wants to put people in like what is the worst situation this character could be in and then right like see how they react and how he thinks that they would respond to that situation. So the boss of it all is like the template for Michael Scott in the office yeah. and. Yeah. And Ricky Gervais, it's just very, this person not only conflates their own importance, but the way that they interpret other people's behavior towards them is so odd. But (laughs) it's kind of, it's kind of relatable though, in a way, because I think that we all sort of walk around as if we're the star of the show. And, And this just sort of exposes that tendency or inclination to think that. You know, that everything is just props around you and that you're going to give your monologue at the end. Yeah, I, yes. And and like, and again, like turning it up to 10 and, and those extremes that he's obsessed with, right? That not only is it just kind of that basic, like the office situation, but with this particular guy who is this stuck up actor and in this particular situation that is so bizarre, that is so like he has to, that he has to act without knowing anything about what's going on and the way that they figure that out like 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 von trier has like posed the situation for himself and he's like wait now i gotta write my way out of this and you can see him like figuring out and see the characters figuring out like what they have to do to get by in in such a strange like just these this situation they find themselves in do you i think that one of the counterpoints i would say if somebody was like like Victor was saying that he's a troll and that he isn't, uh, you know, accessing real moments. I think that in the boss of it all, when we find out that the guy who hired him, who is really the boss, the boss of the boss of it all, uh-huh. uh, that he's actually a terrible person and he kind of shows empathy towards him. And then in like Dancer in the Dark, when the guy steals all her money and she uh-huh. like, pats him on the back and is just like it's okay but can i have it back i i feel like and in the idiots when the two people actually have sex and it's quite uh meaningful there's these uh-huh. moments where you're like whoa like you're taken aback by the level of compassion that's displayed and they're usually towards like very rotten people who've shown themselves to be terrible and then there's like this tremendous mercy that happens and i feel like Von Trier does that better than like arguably anybody I've ever seen where there's like, it's almost a supernatural level of empathy that happens sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, um, that's something that I really agree with and that it's hard. It's hard to argue with that because it's like for all that there are these, you know, crazy provocative moments sometimes it's like the most uncomfortable or the most not uncomfortable but like just i'm feeling everything right now when those genuine moments happen um and i don't i was i wasn't able to watch um breaking the waves for this week but i have seen i watched it um a bit ago with my friend joe and he was sent, talking about this moment uh that i i'm gonna try to remind you of it. I don't know exactly when it comes, but like when Bess is being taken away from her sister, played by Catherine Cartledge, and she's like and Catherine Cartledge is like put just just like I think it's one shot of her like putting her hand over her mouth and just like in genuine shock and fear for like what's going to happen to Bess. And those there there's like those tiny moments that's maybe that's like a second long that like justifies kind of the entire movie. Because they're like just small, like you can just see empathy written on the characters' faces or in like the, their tiny actions. Like, yeah, when she goes to pat him on the back and dance in the dark. Or yeah, or the, or the end like, of the idiots at, yeah. with Karen, where she's yeah. like, we can go now. There's this tremendous, like she understood Karen immediately. Like all of it came together in the kitchen when she's like, she lost her child. It's like, oh my gosh. And and then when it's like, we can go now. And that look, I mean, it's really, 
it like makes me so emotional and the, and yeah. it doesn't matter the rest of the movie, you know, in those times you're like, there's something very, very human and like tender here. That's hard to describe. Yeah. And it's hard to capture. And that's why I feel like for me, I I don't know if those moments always like totally justify the entire movie, but it does make me go back and think like maybe these parts that I initially thought were um, not genuine or that they, that he was just trying to poke fun. Let me investigate that one, one more time and just see like, am I, am I kind of, do I need to grow as a viewer to see like what he's doing here? Um, and I get, again, I don't blame anyone for not doing that. And I don't have this high ground about like, whatever, but, but there's, I, you, those kinds of things don't happen on accident. Those are like very much like you have to be a great filmmaker to get those once in a million times. Um, and he's and he so in their time. face about yeah. it, you know, like the, the, the two parts in the idiots where I felt like they were very intimate moments. He's right there. It's the same with breaking the waves. Uh, Emily Watson and Stella and Skarsgård are so in love and they're so passionate and you can feel it and see it. And, and it's not like the camera is far away, you know, in Dogville it's the same thing where when these people betray her person after person after person, she's still kind to them. She still wants to forgive them. Um, and uh, these, these things aren't just, I don't know. And I will say, I'm glad that I watched the five obstructions like cl very close to the beginning of this because I felt that from Lars to his mentor. Like mm -hmm. I, I did actually feel that Lars, even though he was kind of enjoying putting him in hard situations, I felt like genuine care from him for him, you know, like he, yes. Yeah. It, it really endeared me to him in a way because his collaboration and wanting to bring something out of his friend and wanting him to grow as an artist, even though at the same time he respected him so much, it, you could feel that that was very real. It wasn't put on, you know? I yeah. Don't know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that really and affected me. That's yeah. That's an interesting film as well, because like, I, I think probably that's the closest thing we can see to his approach when he is actually making movies, even though he wasn't technically, um, or for, for the first four obstructions, at least he, he didn't make them at all, but like the way that he undresses people and the way that he is, but at the same time, very respectful. And he's like, you're my hero. Yes. Now I'm going to make you do this dumb shit, <laughs> you know? So like, yeah, uh, the, 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 the purpose of it, it kind of gets to the purpose of what he's, maybe what he writes all the time or why he shoots his films in the shoddy way that he does that like the, the provocation, it has like a purpose to like whatever random thing it is, whatever, like you have to go shoot it in Cuba and it's every edit is 12 frames and you know, like whatever very difficult thing that you have to go through in order to do that. Like hopefully you're getting closer, closer to, some sort of truth inside you or inside the uh, Jurgen Leth who is who got, he idolizes or in the actors that he ha must have a lot of respect for because they have to do these completely you know very dark or destructive or, or like if it's a comedy it's still like just just being being in such discomfort like the character being in such discomfort that like that setup, the setup of like putting someone in the worst possible situation is going to make them reflect as a performer, make him reflect as a writer when he's writing it. And eventually when it's, when all is said and done, you get to something that's very true, even if you can't um, describe it. That's what he's trying to say. I feel like with each obstruction, he, what he's trying to say is you as he tells him, like, you are an observer, and so you allow this level of distance from your art. And he was trying to remove that sense of artifice so that he was able to engage in more. And, you know, I, I felt like the cartoon was the one that I loved the most, and that was the <laughs> most where they're yeah. like, 
I hate cartoons and he's like, I hate him too. You know, good luck. <laughs> yeah, uh, was, but I, it, I, it's great. Out laughing when he said cartoon. That was the, like, again, one of the funniest one sure moments in any film, but sorry, go on. And he's like, I, he's like, I hate him too. But, but <laughs> I'm saying like these, these, uh, things are coming at a, they're coming from this place of like curiosity, but also when he first tells him like, I don't have good news for you. The way they they have that entire conversation is so respectful. I was like, yeah. these guys are like, they should be like conflict resolution yeah. instructors for people in relationships. Yeah. How to say like, I didn't like this, but I still love you and I'm on your side. They were so good about yeah. the phrasing and the words, the whole movie. I was so inspired by how they could be like, I completely disagree with you, but in a, very constructive way when they were so open to being wrong or I don't know, that really set the tone for me for him. Yeah. Seeing yeah. him interact like that and how he spoke to his friend and how he went about the creative process and what he was looking for from then on. I had that in mind of like, this is not a person who's like trying to torture people. He like, if anything, like with antichrist, for instance, he's tortured and he's trying to exercise that from himself. I think that's the best example of that movie is like where he, I felt that he was compelled to do it and would have like killed himself if he hadn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, but and the spirit of collaboration too, that like, but again, like seeing this behind the scene, these behind the scenes moments of, you know, genuine, like, like you're saying genuine respect, which I think he has, if we're going to, kind of extrapolate this to his like the making of his other films which he, we you know we can't see we can just see the finished product and what people say afterwards but like i imagine that's the a similar he goes about directing films in a similar way that's like you maybe the performer did something that that was just totally not what i wanted and that's totally okay because we're going to do a, a bunch more takes and you're going to find it and you're going to get to something that either I like, or I'm surprised by, or I, I, you know, cause he, he does like in each obstruction that you're going to let him make, he's like, he seems like interested and he's surprised. And he's like, I'm ready to watch it when you are. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, and, yeah. and even says like in the second one where he's like, um, there's a problem with, uh, he shows the tragedy, right? Yeah. So he shows with the tragedy. The sh sheer background. Yeah. yeah. So in the red light district. And so like, and so Lars is like, I'm so sorry to say that this does not meet the requirements. You failed. And you like you fit and just you failed. It's a marvelous film, by the way. But like, this is not what I wanted. It's it's brutal, but it's so constructive. I, yeah. I feel like it's just in such a good such the right spirit for helpful feedback. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of see that in all of his films, there's sort of a non-judgmental attitude and a, and a, I think there is a striving towards excellence. Even when you go from like, I think he did breaking the waves and then the idiots after like those, those were in the, the order. And yeah. it's kind of hard to believe that Yeah, because breaking the waves, I think is very beautifully shot and the music in it and the, the gravitas of the, the, like, the Isle of Sky and the the themes and everything, and then to to go from that to that, but then at the same time you can you can see thematically that he's still the same person. It's just that he's experimenting with all these different ones. And then when you see Melancholia, it's like we're more towards like normal cinematic structures. You know the way Melancholia looks. I think that's mm -hmm. probably his most what do I want to say like professional looking film. Maybe. Commercial, maybe? Or, maybe you know, commercial. Sort of, but, yeah. Sort of, yeah. In terms of what it looks like. Yeah. And in terms and in terms of, like, you sh you show that to someone, and they're like, oh, this is, like, some weird art house film, you know, whatever. Uh, yeah. With, you know, the slow motion at the beginning, and the, and obviously it's handheld and everything. But then you, if you, but you have to start there, because you can't, <laughs> if you go straight to the idiots, they're like, what is this, a weird YouTube video? <laughs> like, what, what am yeah. I watching right now? Which is like, yeah, that's that's something I love too about his films is that like they're so like in in a, in a way he just does not care about the presentation in in some respects, um, and I think that goes back to the five instructions where it's like 
whatever limits, particularly in the Dogma 95 um, rules, like whatever limits I can put on myself, I'll put them on myself if it means that I can still make a good film at the end of the day, you know, and I can still like push through these limitations and be creative with it and find a way to make it um, like maybe it'll look still like crap, but like it'll have something true inside it anyway, you know. Do you feel like in some ways that he thinks in terms of like vignettes? Because I I remember this from Nymphomaniac especially where it shifts very quickly. Like 10 minutes later, it's like there, like the way that it feels is kind of jarring. So you feel like you're not even watching the same movie at times. And Breaking the Waves kind of does that with the title cards where mm-hmm. you're just completely taken out of a style or something by a song or the way that it's shot. And and it's kind of seems like he's he thinks in terms of short stories rather yeah. than like a full narrative. Yeah, and I, I think in some ways that's maybe like the most direct kind of attack on the audience is is formally like the changes that that one of the films might go through, like particularly *Nymphomaniac*, is like so. You know, there's there's text on screen sometimes with a three plus five, and like there's. <laughs> you know it changes actresses midway through and they don't really they're not really similar not that they're not i don't think that's a bad thing necessarily but like they're because i think they're both stacy martin and gainsburg are both great performers but like and then coming back to like the 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 sort of um almost this verge-esque virgin jack-esque right thing with scar right. scars guard um right like th- that throwing you around these different tones or different things that you're seeing or ways that you're seeing them, like ways to interpret them is like, so, and I think even the, at the beginning of Nymphomaniac, there's like, there's like a bunch of shots of like water running or whatever in the, in the uh-huh. alleyway. And then a song plays for no reason. And then it stops. I'm just like, what am I watching? But like that again, like about undressing the audience and addressing like who you're working with, like making you so aware of like, this is kind of like, I, I don't necessarily like this, the way that he's doing this, but it turns your brain on and makes you like think about like, okay, how, how am I going to like interpret the rest of this film, whether I like it or not? Like it, it's like, he's very intentional about like getting you to access your empathy and access your, your like make you lean forward in a way that's either like, I totally hate this or I totally love this, but either way you're like invested in like in how things are happening and why they're happening or if there if there's even a reason that it had to be this way. It's almost like collages yeah. in a way where I feel like there's and I think it's most in Nymphomaniac and House the Jack Built cuz House the Jack Built does the same thing where it's like uh, one minute you're looking at like a guy play the piano and then you're looking at paintings and yeah. then there's even a part towards the end where Lars shows clips from his own movies <laughs> yeah. like in a row and you're like oh my gosh like what is this yeah. you know that's what that's why I think that that movie is the most where he really is like adaptation is trying to figure stuff out bet- amongst himself and then like analyzing his art in the way that Jack is trying to do so with his art, which yeah. isn't, but you know what I mean with the incidents. So uh, yeah, it's like, it's very visually interesting, but I think that Von Trier would not be good at all. If all it was were gimmicks, if all we're yeah. doing is just all these different mediums and ways to show things, but there wasn't something at the core. I don't think I would have liked any of yeah, them. I mean, and that that's what you see so much in like, I think especially like younger filmmakers or student filmmakers that are kind of around my age that are like just using these different styles and stocks and cameras to be like, Oh wow, this is such a cool camera. But like the effect it's having on the movie, like, I mean, you can, you should experiment with like different things and like see what's, what's best. Or if it's a combination or collage, like you're saying, like that makes this the most powerful but like doing it for the sake of like, I think this will look cool is kind of not, I don't know. I think that's a little misguided and I don't, and Von Trier isn't like necessarily, I mean, it doesn't seem like he's trying to make him look cool all the time or make it look 
beautiful. There is that kind of ending montage in, in House of Jackal that is very like painterly and has all these like art historical references and, and things like that. And maybe more stationary um, or slow motion things that he's using. But again, like there's there's almost like this intention to destroy the, the, the form and to like mess with it in a way that it doesn't look elegant. Um, and that that shock of like, you know, apart from the content of his stories, which we've talked about, but like just looking at them and looking at the way that they're put together, um, not to mention just like the, <laughs> the way that he'll like cut from like, it'll be a shot of, you know, it's a shot of me and you cuts to five seconds later. It's the same shot of me and you, but just like when we're slightly talking about, yeah it's just right. slightly forward in time for no reason yes. and it's like right that that is so exciting to me because it's not like it's it's not in service of like himself he's trying to like these obstructions or whatever that he puts on his own movies um in that way like the guy playing the piano or mi- this mixed media stuff is kind of like intentionally it's so intentionally jarring and it's so intentionally like puts you ill at ease you know and it so the the formal qualities like with the content is like just make you just make you aware of what's going on and if if it if this appeals to you or if it provokes you or if it does anything you know you're at least like aware of like this is a movie that is making decisions in front of me and i and i should probably pay attention and i should know what i how i interpret each of these things I honestly, this is kind of in the vein of why I gave Dancer in the Dark five stars, and I think it's a masterpiece because the way that it's shot and how it looks should not work at all. Like, I think it's one of the ugliest, like, (laughs) looking movies I've ever seen, and I don't enjoy looking at it. Just, but, and then the the singing and the way that everything is choreographed when she's singing, you know, by the train tracks and everything, you're just like, this looks terrible. Like yeah. it looks worse than a student, like a film student, mm-hmm. student film. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that that's like, I don't know, maybe this is a brand of pretension that I'm not considering, but it feels opposite pretension to me to be like, I'm going to completely take away your ability to uh, not see this as like a doc style. Like you're going to watch this as if it's a documentary and it's really happening and it's not pretty and it's not glossy and it's not beautiful, but then you're going to feel like it is because Mm -hmm. of the story and her performance is just, it's insane. And like I sobbed during that movie and it is not half the time. I'm like, I shouldn't, I should be critiquing the way that this is shot. Yeah. And I, and I don't like even the angles and stuff. I'm just like, what is it? Like the boss of it all. Like what, where are you putting this? Yeah. What are you thinking? <laughs> but it, it still is reaching. It's insane. I I can't really think of another filmmaker like that where I'm almost against my will invested and, and uh, like emotionally in mm-hmm. a real way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Despite I, that, that. That's something I think is like, it's it's handled pro- i mean dance in the dark is also like that's my favorite of his filmography and um i think with that movie in particular the way i describe it to other people when i'm trying to recommend it you know uh, yeah. and maybe um good for, luck for better good luck with that but <laughs> but anyway when I, when i am trying to describe it to people i'm like the the formal elements of of that film in particular don't really matter they're not like it in a way that's like, I think so, basically all other directors would try to make that like visually appealing. Cause why wouldn't you, <laughs> you know, there's, it's not like, it's not like a novel kind of thing to be like, I'm going to make this look, this film look good. <laughs> like th- that's what you're trying to do all the time. But the, w- but the fact that it isn't pretty, it like kind of, I kind of, my mind just is like taken off of it after a while. I, I kind of don't care how it looks. I don't care how, if the sound quality is good or bad. I don't care if like any of these things are lining up. So like all that starts to disappear. And then it's just like, what are the characters doing and what are they saying and how are they feeling? And that's it. That's all you're left with. So it's, it's, it's destructive in a way that 
ends up being a positive force in the movie. Which is ex- pretty much exactly the way I feel about Dogville. Like, mm-hmm. Dogville formally is calling attention to the artifice of the situation deliberately. Like, mm-hmm. they're opening doors that aren't there. They're making sound effects. You can see it's a the high chalk. Play. <laughs> yeah. You know that they're on a stage. Literally, like, they're pantomiming everything. And then somehow it transcends. So, like, you're saying where after a while your brain adapts in in a way and and you feel like all the actions they're doing are legitimate and you know actually happening and i love that dogville especially is literally calling attention to that and you're buying into it anyway just like dancing in the dark it's like this isn't going to look good like the courtroom scene i love the song in the courtroom scene and uh, and like them clapping and everything and it looks awful. It it just looks so <laughs> terrible. And uh it's amazing. I just I I feel like he I don't know, like it's almost like he's on a dare. Like the five yeah. obstructions where he's like daring himself to create situations where it would be really really hard to transcend them and then he does it yeah. somehow. But it's just a self-handicapped like how yes. can I put weights on myself while I'm while I'm doing this run? To like yes. towards you know emotional investment and empathy, and he actually does it. Um, and I, I think that's like, especially with Dog Villain, Dancer in the Dark. Like, one thing that I see throughout his films is like this. I mean, the dare is on himself in a lot of ways, but then it's uh, then it becomes on the audience. Like, what are you willing to believe? Because or what are you willing to invest in? Because we have like you know, generations of films and then even further back hundreds and thousands of years of just like telling stories and like what we've learned kind of just maybe in your individual life, but also as humans of like, what, what are we going to believe or why is this fantasy thing about, you know, why is Lord of the Rings totally like, Oh yeah, I can totally buy into that. And that makes sense to me. But then something else, like if, if Lord of the Rings was shot the way dance in, in the dark was, for example, it wouldn't be believable. Like, why is that? Why, why do we not like, why can we not like get past certain things? And so he's saying like, I'm going to, I'm going to throw this at you and I'm going to make it like the worst thing you've ever seen, like visually, but still like, can you, are you able to get past that block and just be like, is this a compelling story or is it not? You know? And there's so many times where the opposite of that is true, where just because something looks great, does not mean that it is good. And I think that's what we get more of now. Like if we're talking about like younger directors specifically, like Eggers and Astor and Lowry, where like they're able to make things that are high production value in the indie way, but still I think they are, you know, Mm -hmm. and they, and they have talent, but I, I feel like it's tempting to just give people credit for, like you're saying with your friends making making these things where you utilize cool things, but then what's the story? Yeah. You know, that's something that, and that really annoys me just in general, because I, I mean, when I was applying to colleges, I got into, I'm going to kind of uh, (laughs) besmirch some names here. uh, But I was, um, when I was applying to colleges, I got into USC film school actually. And they, they're part of the, um, I might've told you this already. I don't remember, but like um, they had, I think I did tell you this, where they have like the the different sections of the film school, like animation, games, editing, et cetera, et cetera. And so I got into the cinema studies. And so if you're in the cinema studies, you don't do production or like anything else, really, like not much of it. And then if you're in the production, you don't do the cinema studies or anything else. So it's like, what gives, you know, why am I going to learn about making films or why I'm making films? Or am I going to and then not be able to make them or am I going to make them and not know why I'm doing it? So exactly like, the, the, like, I think that's a lot of what you see today is like, and where people are like, Oh, I hate going to the movies or where it's just uninspired because it, it's not, you don't know why you're making it and you don't, there's not like a story that you have to tell. Um, and whereas, I, I mean, again, like you're saying with, with Antichrist, for example, Von Trier would have been way worse off if he didn't make that movie. Like genuinely from a personal 
level. And so you like, there, there's this reason of like, like that you have to find or that you just have to know what's there. Like you don't have to articulate it necessarily, but like that, you know, like this is something that I'm really passionate about and no matter how it looks, no matter what the budget is, if I can only do it for a hundred dollars or shoot it on my phone or shoot it in like, still frames that are just pictures a sequence of pictures like a slideshow i'm going to tell the story and it's going to be like if it is really coming from an honest place within you then none of that stuff really matters as much i re i remember i mean i hated antichrist as a film but i was very interested in why i hated it so much so i watched a bunch of interviews willem dafoe and lars and i think i even saw the making of it if that exists but there was something about how dafoe was saying that he was having that Lars was having deeply disturbing thoughts and journaling and he turned the journaling into the movie. And so it didn't matter necessarily like, was it going to be a hit? It was like, we're talking about like a, almost a compulsion. And I think of that, like with David Lynch with Eraserhead, like I think he was only 30 years old or maybe mm -hmm. younger than that when he made it. And that movie, I don't like it either, but I can tell that it's, I acknowledge that it's brilliant and that yeah. it's, it's unusual and it's he didn't have a lot of money, but when you watch that movie, it holds up, you know, and yeah. and there's so there's just something about I think there's something about, I guess, auteurs or whatever you want to say, directors who have clarity of vision and they're able to use whatever is at their disposal and the story elevates their technical or production limitations, but they still utilize those. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, yeah, they still use the best of what they have. And then it turns out to be this amazing thing where you're like, wow, you know, yeah, where, it doesn't yeah. seem like you could limit this person. Exactly. Which is true for Jürgen Leff in the five instructions. And that's true for Lars von Trier in the rest of what he's made. And like, Oh man, I forgot what I was going to say, but they like, I guess, yeah. With antichrist, then it's about like, it's about like when you watch it again, it's like undressing the audience just as you undress your actors, your characters, whoever, like the things that you're working with or the form that you're working with and just make it all like, like sort of like the, that Brechtian approach in Dogville of just like remove all the artifice and what do you have left? Then as an audience member, when you're watching a film, if you don't like it, it's because you truly like, I just don't like this movie and I don't like what's at its core or I don't like the characters or whatever. And you can know that and be okay with it in a way that I don't know, like I, I, I feel is like more, I feel that's more honest in a way that that's like versus if, I don't know if you, if you don't like a movie for these superfluous reasons or because the filmmaker is trying to trick you, that's what I appreciate about, about Von Trier is that for all the hate that he gets, I don't think there's any, like all the, and why I agree with kind of every reaction to any one of his movies is that like, they're all coming from a place of like, I either really love this or I really didn't, or I just felt kind of mid about it because it was like, but I could either any spectrum of your opinion is like, I saw what was happening and what I saw, I did not like. And it's not anything more complicated than that. It's not like you being tricked or, you know, tricked into liking something, tricked into not liking something, into being provoked by something. It's just like the most basic kind of storytelling that is like, and where at the end you question yourself and it's like, why did I enjoy this character? Why did I not? And it makes us learn more about how we react to stories and how stories can be told and how then we can move on and be like, what limitations could I put on myself to like to obstruct myself and then maybe get closer to the art and not distance myself from it and not have like, not let it be continue in this pattern of kind of, again, like tr tricking, tricking your audience, which I think maybe, I don't know, I guess people say that about Von Trier too, but I think the opposite is true that like he, I don't... that everyone else besides him, or not everyone, but but the kind of opposite end of the spectrum against him is really tricking their audience. And he is just being like, no, this is what it is. And you can like it or you can hate it. And I don't really care. I feel like it's more of like a dare than a trick. 
I feel like when mm. I don't feel that he is dishonest or uh, manipulative, honestly. I feel like he's just daring us to have an open mind and maybe be receptive to material that we would normally reject outright. And that's kind of why I watched The Idiots because at the beginning I thought, oh my gosh, I yeah. don't want to do this. Yeah. And then I thought, okay, if we're if I think about the five obstructions and I'm thinking about like what my interpretation of his posturing is, it's that this isn't just for naught. Like it's not just indulgent and, and he, it, he does have something to say and I think he did say it. And I'm glad that I stayed to the end because that sort of summarizes the whole perspective. Part of the called Golden Heart Trilogy was D Dancer and the Idiots and Breaking the Waves where he sees these women as very pure of heart who are just trying to find meaning and will do anything to get there. And it's just very moving in all three of those cases. Yeah. And with, again, like, and how different they all feel kind of formally, but maybe like, and the idiots is maybe played as more of a comedy and the other two definitely aren't their tragedies. And, but like, but it, it's, it's like, it's getting a, a, a true reaction out of you. What, whether you what you like the movie or you don't like the movie, or if you're like, if you're laughing or you're crying during the idiots, I'd be like, yeah, both of those are fair because it's, it's not like, it's it's accessing something that's deeper than genre or deeper than um then you you have to kind of choose to go within yourself and be like i'm gonna investigate why i don't like this and i'm gonna or i'm gonna investigate why i do like this and no like i think anyone who can do that and can just let us know more about stories is like you know, I, I think about Von Trier when I'm watching other films a lot of the time, who, which are maybe more formally. And I don't it's not I'm not saying that, like, you shouldn't try to make your films like look good or, or feel good. Yeah. You know, it's it's not about that. It's, I think it's just about like. Um, being like having having a hyper awareness, uh, like training your awareness as uh, as either an aspiring artist or or just as someone who likes to engage in in stories well and i think the fact of the matter too is that whenever you see moments of authenticity or honesty in art it doesn't need anything like you know i don't know if you saw the movie conclave that just came out i have with Ray but, Fiennes. yeah no I well there's this it's really good but there's a scene in there where somebody a character gives a speech and it's just him and there's no gimmicks and there's no there's no there's no parade about it he just stands up and says something and you're like oh my gosh and I I don't know so I'm always so aware that the moments in film especially that get me where I could literally sit there sobbing hardly ever have any sort of grandeur you know it, it's mm -hmm. like these quieter moments of just intense sincerity where maybe the camera isn't even doing anything and you're just taken aback by the realness of it. And I think that's, I think that Von Trier captures that more often than not, which is why even in the films that I don't like that he does, that I rate really low, I still could tell you that in those movies, there's some moment of connection or tenderness or grace that uh, is, is hard to find in any movie, much less in a person's consistent, filmography yeah yeah it's it's you know when when and that's like it requires bravery to put that out there like i, I think maybe watching von trier like now that we've been watching him and we're going to come out of this and now just go into like i feel like i'm waking up and i'm like in the sun and i'm like wait <laughs> getting what out of the forest <laughs> yeah um yeah. and uh but but now but then you you go to the other stuff and you're like you're maybe uh, like aware of when you're being tricked uh when it's not a dare it is a trick and it, and it's like but when you can see directors in various styles that again don't have to be like this dogma whatever but like where maybe the you cut the music 
and you just see the character speaking for who they are, or you cut the, you remove the artifice somehow. Um, and there's so many ways to do that. And there's so many ways to not have like, to, 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 to not be disingenuous about it. That I, that I think it like, it's valuable for people to learn like, what you know when when an artist is is being genuine and not just when it's like i think it's fair to like not want to engage in with Vontre's work but the reward for doing so with Vontre or with anyone else who would like might have the same philosophy of these obstructions right and obstructing and limiting yourself so that you can work creatively like if you can stomach it then it's like it i think you end up like a better viewer in the end you know i agree and i i will end by saying that i think that two of the sh most shocking things i found out about him were that he's a catholic and uh that he's been married two times and has four kids yeah. i literally would have told you like my, my guess was that this person was never married <laughs> never had kids and a total atheist and i read today that like he has always been interested in faith and religion because his parents were like very strong atheists and he grew up in a home where people are not allowed to show emotion. So mm -hmm. I just think all this is so interesting because when you, when you put all these pieces together, it, it does inform the work. I know like some people don't like thinking about the director at all when they watch something. Mm -hmm. I obviously am not that person. Otherwise I wouldn't do this series. <laughs> yeah. But the more, the more that you marathon things like I did with Malik, especially I watched like nine in a week and I was so aware of Malik. Like I had this idea of who is this person with all the narration and all the searching about God. And um, so it's just so interesting to, to think about like, how did this person's upbringing literally reflect in all these repressed societies in these films where people are not allowed to express their emotions. That could literally just be that that's how he grew up in his house. And now yeah. we have like 10 and, movies where that's the case. Yeah. And that not only were that, you know, just that's the plot, but like literally the, the craziest and worst things are happening because it's like, that's just how I'm feeling right now. And that's what I need to get out. And that's what I need to expunge from my system so that I can feel good again. And that's, right. you know, and making that in art is like the most valuable thing you can do with those feelings, I think, is is to put them into a place that is like productive and can inspire others or can turn others away from you. But either way, like you're you're doing something that that is like not, that I don't think that you're not Jack. You're not doing right. it in a way that Jack is doing it he like he's making that metaphor obviously but like to the the courage to not like resort to your like those dark harm. impulses you know and and to harm others or to harm yourself and the courage to like put your feelings into something that and then you're called provocative and then like everyone either loves or hates your films. And it's like, well, I'm just going to keep doing it because I still need to do it. You know? I think, I think you're right. I think if you can transform your pain or renew it through art, I think that is probably, I would think that as an, as a creator, that that would be the most cathartic way to release or, yeah. you know, to, to wrestle with those things would be yeah. to do it in a safe, productive way. And, and any, and any, time I can watch that if it's him or if it's, you know, anyone else who's, who's really capable of doing that, it's like thrilling to watch. And it's thrilling to yeah. like see someone just at the top of their emotionality and being like the most expressive that they can and allowing other people to do the same. Like, again, this, this, the most extreme movies you can think of. And then it, but it's like, filmed like the idiots is you know or or th th that contrast is also just so interesting but yeah interesting yeah well miles thank you for uh challenging me with this and uh we both have a movie subscription now yeah because we that's where all of your stuff is yeah pretty much. Uh, so if you're wondering where to watch everything just get a movie subscription because he's got i still have to watch the kingdom which i'm really excited about at some point 
um that's on there too that's the tv series that he made over like i don't know a 20 year period or it something was, yeah, i just saw 94 it. 97 and then the third season was in 2022 like, yeah yeah so that's also fascinating um but um thank you so much miles for this this has been yeah. a wonderful conversation yes and um we'll see you at the movies yeah <laughs>